So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. The Mishnah had become a holy, whole, it was holy, it was sacrosanct really to to support, you know, it was it just was the thing to do su to support uh, the these laws and the the value of them. And in in order to substantiate the place of these laws, it was stated that actually this law had been given orally, as we've indicated that it was the oral tradition because it had been given orally to Moses at Mount Sinai at the same time that the written law was given. And then, as we said, it was passed down from generation to generation, uh, first through Joshua and then through the, the elders at that time, then through the prophets, eventually through uh, the men of the the synagogue, the great synagogue who lived at the time of Ezra, and then through the Supremes to the Tananim. They would take the Mishnah and discuss the Mishnah, talk about it, and add interpretation to interpretation. Huh? And so this had all come up to Jesus' time. This was what was going on. Eventually, in about 200 A.D., it was compiled, I, I guess, in written form. Huh? Then the, all of this oral tradition was compiled into written form by Yehuda, Yehuda, the prince, yeah, when it was uh, written down. And then later, other scholars uh, came along and added their views. So you have views on top of views on top of views. And they commented on the comments of those who had commented on the text. <laughs> and added uh, their views to the traditions of the elders. And, um, and their compilation was called the Gemara, right? The Gemara. And it is the Gemara and the Mishnah then that form the Talmud. The Talmud. Yeah. The Talmud has both uh, stories and codes of law in it. So this was Jesus' great issue. Isn't that something? Wow, we're not really so aware of that when we read the text, are we? Aware of that background. His, his great issue was really one of interpretation. That's... That's principle. Personal human interpretation or scientific interpretation of the scripture, you see, of the, the law. He really was Christ the scientist. Huh? He really was the scientist. Yeah. These are the old garments to which he refers. Remember he talks about the, par has the parables of the old garments, the old wineskins or the old bottles, trying to put that which is new into the old form. You hear it's, a, it's that paradigm question. Am I going to try to keep the old paradigm or what is just as bad to try to take and a new paradigm, something about the new paradigm, and incorporate it into the old paradigm. 
These, uh, these old wineskins, the old garments, were at that time the traditions that had been built up. And Jesus said he hadn't come to build on top of these old uh, traditions or, or to support them, that he had come to do something completely different, namely to show the science of man, the science of being that was inherent in the Torah, in the, in the scriptures. So that's the clash that was ensuing. I had a quote here from a writer by the name of Rollins who has written about the, the Bible and about this particular issue. He says, God's revelation of himself in the Torah was as precious to Jesus as any of his compatriots, his con the contemporary leaders, the difference lay in his conception of how it was to be used, expressed, expressed and lived, in other words, how it was to be put into operation, how it was to be expressed in, in one's life. Um, that is what Jesus is addressing uh, now in this fourth standpoint of principle. Just to give you a, a little instance of that, what they called the hedge or the fence about the Torah, all these man-made laws. For instance, you know there is that law, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh thou shalt not do any work because the seventh is the Sabbath, and in it thou shalt, keep, you should keep it holy. Nothing, no one should work, neither what thine, thine ox, nor thine ass, nor thy manservant or maidservant, or, you know, and then it, it lists all uh, those things, those aspects that within us that shouldn't work, that should rest. It's a, you know, a beautiful symbol of love. But in their anxiety, you know, they would become very, very anxious not to break that law, not to break any of these laws. So in their anxiety to keep the Sabbath law, thou shalt not do any work, they had to answer the question, what is work? What is work? So they saw that there were 39 kinds of activity that could be classified as work and that all of those activities would be prohibited on the Sabbath day. I don't know them all. I think uh, one of them, you know, was you couldn't take your donkey out on, on the Sabbath. You couldn't ride your donkey on the Sabbath. But each of those 39 then types of work underwent further definition and classification. You see, it's a wrong sense of, of classification and systemization. So they further defined what those types of work would mean, all in the attempt really to cover every possible situation about work. And there turned out to be about 1,500 additional commandments that specified this one one true commandment, thou shalt not do any work on the Sabbath, requiring detailed memorization. Can you imagine trying to remember? Now, let me see, can, am I able to do that? I, no, I don't think so. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How am I going to find out if it's all right for me to do this? There was a, such a desire to adhere to the law, to be lawful to do the right thing, yet you see that there would be that anxiety of the fear of not obeying the law. All of that versus uh, Jesus and his creative insight, you see the creativity and the spiritual insight into the application of a principle, of what the basic foundational principle is and how that is applied through 
the mind of Christ. It's terrific. I have here that that principle makes inexhaustibly new claims on man all the time versus the attempt to produce an exhaustive definition of obligations under the law. See that? So if you had approximately 1,500 uh, commandments of the things that you ought not to do on the Sabbath day, if you didn't do any of them, then you would be okay. But... This made a tremendous burden on the people. You can sense that the people were just burdened down. They were weighed down with this heavy burden of having to obey the law. Uh, Again, now, the definition of day, which would be the Sabbath, referring to the Sabbath day, the irradiance of life, truth, and love. Yeah. And that would be what he wanted to to bring out. Well, let's uh, close by seeing what the attractor in this field is and will be. What is love's goal at the point of principle? It is to establish within us the science of being, that there is a science of being, a science of life, a science that would cover every detail, every experience, every action of one's daily life, and that love would want to Establish that science within us as our method and means, really, of interpretation to how to interpret the answer to everything. Hmm? This would involve freeing us from the mortal sense, a, a personal interpretation, a personal system or contrivance of organization from which to draw all of our conclusions and answers and uh, to know how to make decisions and everything that the science of being would replace or would oust out anything else that is not the science of being. principle will work together with life uh, to set forth and give us a science of life, a new style of life, a new paradigm, the paradigm, the one legitimate paradigm for our life. In place of of a hypocritical sense of life, in place of a hypocritical sense of life. And you'll see how much that hypocrisy comes in uh, to to the story. Ye hypocrites, ye hypocrites, that that other, what do I want to say? It's not a real system. It's a a human contrivance of organization Mm -hmm. that was full of hypocrisy, of of self-contradiction, that this is going to be overturned. Jesus was overturning that. Love was there at the point of fulfillment to be sure that that statement, the statement of that, the presentation of it, the setting forth of that new principle, that new understanding of what the law actually was, what the law of God is in its science and system. This was to be ensured by, by love. 
So how was love going to bring that into being? It would retrocause it through the causality, the retrocausality, the super causality of love as principle, love working really in its office as truth and as life, so that love would impel a whole new teaching on the people, a new interpretation principle for life. You can feel that uh, what a lifting that would be, huh? It would lift the burden of existence. That true principle brings life itself, brings inspiration, newness, that soaring, that sense of soaring above the mortal concept of things. So principle and life are always intimately related and connected. And we will see how love establishes that new principle of of being, that new teaching of the science of life when we return this afternoon. And it does it through its office as truth and as life. Okay? Very good. Thank you.